One of my hot takes, as they call them, hot takes, by the way, that's just Zuma talk for informed and righteous opinions. One of the uh, hot takes I came up with back in 2016 was I said, listen, eventually on a long enough time scale, you think it won't happen, but the people from BuzzFeed, the people, all the games journalists, all the shit bloggers with their little political biases and willing, willingness to abuse their platforms and lie to get what they want and get, you know, the, their way, they're going to take over the America's newsrooms. They are going to be in these publications. People said, you said to me at the time, that'll never happen. In fact, there was a common copy pasta at the time. People used to post it to, you know, Joe Bernstein, whatever his name is from uh, BuzzFeed and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, you'll never work for the New York Times. You'll never work for Washington Post. You will always be a games journalist. You will always be BuzzFeed. You will always be a loser. And obviously on a long enough time scale, what unfortunately the, the cunts, the losers, they were always on course to replace the kind of older generation of journalists, many of whom were problematic in their own way, but compared to the motherfuckers, the, the privileged uh, lunatics coming out of Berkeley and places like this with their journalist degrees, obviously, guess what was going to happen? I mean, you know, they, they were going to go into the graduate placements. They were going to use their wealthy families with their wealthy family contacts to get into these newsrooms to validate their existence. And that's absolutely what happened. So I was right on that one. And there is no worse example of this than Taylor Lorenz. Now, Taylor Lorenz is so staggeringly awful she is going to get her own episode of enemy of the people she is everything that is wrong with modern american journalism she is like that journalist in season five of the wire she lies about anything and everything she's been caught in these lies multiple fucking times she is more interested in being an influencer herself she has used her connections to have this like ascent into working for two of the biggest papers she used to be at the new york times she essentially failed at least sideways depending on how you look at it and ended up at the washington post and she has been destroying that newsroom and the camaraderie and the togetherness within that newsroom from the moment she got there because she continually refuses to adhere to the basic tenets of journalistic ethics all the while, by the way, saying, the only reason people attack me is because I'm a young woman on the internet. Spoiler, we don't even know a real age because she keeps setting it all over the place. As I'll probably get to, I'm going to suspect she isn't the under 35 woman that she claims to be. Now, listen, we're all 39 in Richard's world, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, when you, when you are a, a journalist working for the number one publication in America, and people can't pinpoint your age because you've tied yourself up in so many lies and different tweets and everything else, and you continually want to get like, I'm in the Forbes under 40 under 40, and it's like, are you even under fucking 40? You know what I mean? This is a problem. So anyway, Taylor Lorenz is awful. And because she's awful, she was doing awful journalism. Her most recent effort of which, ironically, was to tell us about how uh, terrible it is that content creators aren't beholden to journalistic standards, which apparently they're not. You can see here, this was the article entitled, Who Won the Depp Heard Trial? Content creators that went all in. Now, what does this mean? Okay, well, listen. One of the things, I'm always a bit weird about it i could have covered this trial i could have streamed it probably would have done pretty well out of it not like amazing you know i'm only 1811 out of a long list of twitch streamers i could have done lots of things uh around this but i want i think when a trial is ongoing i don't want to be chipping in with commentary when i'm not a lawyer or a legal expert by the way if lawyers want to stream it and add commentary while they're doing it that's perfectly fine with me but also as well i always kind of worry a little bit about influencing public opinion like say there was a mistrial there's always that small percentage that a potential juror in the future might have seen your content and you've influenced them and it goes on to influence the case and you know but have to, they're meant to disclose it when they do what's it what not for what dear is it for what dear jury selection in america i think it is anyway whatever but you know they, they, they just stay away from ongoing cases by and large just stay away from that a lot of content creators made a lot of money 
of this sort of trial of the century. Why was the Depp Heard trial so popular? Well, it encapsulates a lot of issues, doesn't it? It was a um, hijacking of the Me Too movement by someone who themselves was abusive. That's a problem. That's a problem a lot of people have talked about for a long time. That, listen, we all acknowledge, everyone acknowledges the Me Too movement absolutely had to happen. It had to happen. I don't even remember, by the way, at, when the first wave of Me Too's come in and it got scum like Weinstein and people like this. I don't remember people objecting to it and saying, oh, God, this is... You know, they, uh, well, they're coming for the men. I'm getting the vapors. I don't remember any of that. I remember people saying, thank God we're finally going to go around Hollywood and round up all these fucking scumbags. Thank fuck. Get these scumbags out. I remember that. But what started happening was, by the time it gets to someone like Aziz Ansari, who is having an article written about him, about how he's a shit date, because he had a date with a girl, got back to her apartment, said, hey, you want to have sex? She said no, started crying, and he put her in a taxi, and apparently that was a me too. By the time you get there, and that's a me too, from the grotesque, horrific sexual abuse and rape in Hollywood, you've got a problem here, and uh, it, it, it sort of mutated into something different, and and then sort of became like a malignant presence in other unrelated social movements. So there was that going on. A lot of people were interested in what it would mean for the Me Too movement. And also a lot of people have an issue with this sort of blanket statement, believe all women, you know, and a lot of people feel this is sort of a perfect validation of, you know, you believe evidence, you believe facts, you, be, you know, you can be supportive in a moment, whether or not someone's telling the truth, but it's absolutely imperative that, you know, blind wholesale belief in anything, that's faith, that's not fact-based, that's potentially dangerous, and actually it's generally the accepted standard in our society that you're innocent until proven guilty, even if you have strong suspicions. So, Taylor Lorenz has seen this, and because she herself has designs of being a TikTok influencer, influencer of being you know uh, the star of the show she probably looked at this and and uh, what's common with all of her reporting she reports about like mr beast she reports about like you know popular people and popular happenings within like tiktok and social media and it's clearly driven by bitterness and jealousy she's that pathetic so she saw a bunch of uh you know content creators that probably aren't politically aligned with her thought process about the case and she thought uh, and also thought why aren't people reading my coverage why am i not making millions from talking about this when i am taylor lorenz the tiktok journalist <laughs> she was thinking that and she thought well i'll just leverage my platform to write a hit piece about how you shouldn't follow these content creators because they don't adhere to journalistic standards that was what it was called who won the depth her trial the content creators that went all in she picked out a bunch of content creators and did a bunch of like just unbelievable things like here's one okay the content creator uh Al alit uh mosaica earned five thousand in one week by pivoting their content on her youtube channel to non-stop trial coverage and analysis according to business insider she declined to comment for this story that umbrella guy an anonymous youtuber's entire channel is dedicated to pro depth content earned up to eighty thousand dollars last month according to an estimate by social analytics firm social blade that umbrella guy could not be reached for comment uh, Oryx said he earned over five thousand four hundred dollars last month in Instagram Reels. Now let's um, let's just do a couple of things here uh, before we even get into the rest of this story, right? So, okay, first of all, uh, if you know the the Mosaic uh, channel, uh, it covers all sorts of stuff relating to law, relating to business, and yeah, it's an ongoing trial. Why wouldn't you make daily videos, especially if they work? It's just standard. The uh, and, and and also. $5,000 in one week for a, a content creator with hundreds of thousands of followers is not really all that much. It's absolutely nothing. Uh, uh, you know, these people make a lot of money. But what was really interesting is this part. That umbrella guy, an anonymous YouTuber whose entire channel is dedicated to pro-depth content, earned up to up to $80,000 last month. Now, first of all, she lied about that number. It's Taylor Lorenz. She had to fit in a lie. The actual number that it was up to, according to Social Blade, was like 79 it was like 79,000 or 78. So she decided to like round it up to the bigger number. But here's the thing. 
it's a scale, and the scale was like two hundred and fifty dollars to like seventy nine thousand. And if you don't believe me, go look at any content creator on Social Blade right now. Right, Social Blade cannot accurately predict how much you make off a video. There's so many variables. It's like which like management group am I with? Like, you know, what ads are being served on my channel? Was the video demonetized? How long was it demonetized for? What type of ads? Have I said it's an adult feature? Some, uh, how many people look at my video that are using ad block? How many people have me white labeled? How much money am I getting off YouTube Red? There's all these variables. Now, if Taylor Lorenz, who often presents herself as a formative expert on the world of influencers, if Taylor Lorenz is that, which she says she is, then she absolutely knows this. So this can only be deliberately malicious to go for the higher number to make it more salacious and more sensational when in actual fact she could have at least just published the scale and the scale is so big to, as to make it meaningless now i'll tell you you never get the upper end of the scale like if you go look at my social blade you'll see and also sometimes it's inaccurately low like i had one it says i make five pounds a day off my youtube well no listen it's it's definitely not that low uh, on those days, you know, it, it can be anything. It can be a few hundreds. Typically, on a bad day, you're going to make close to 100 on a relatively active YouTube channel with over 117,000 uh, subscribers. But it's basically a guess. <laughs> That's all it is. It's Social Blade. They're very good for followers. They're very good for, like, you know, impressions, cross multiple things. What they are not good at is predicting monetization. They, they, they simply cannot do it. The, it's too obfuscated by the YouTube API. But what Taylor Lorenz deliberately did was to make it more sensational, she put in the upper tier number and then ascribed it to Social Blade, which she couldn't do because Social Blade basically said... But Social Blade acknowledges with its vastness of scale that this is not the important part of the number. But she basically wanted to make it salacious, lied about the amount anyway, then attributed it to Social Blade. That's just who she is as a journalist. Then, on top of that, you'll notice they were contacted for comment, but they decided not to comment. Hold on to that thought. Okay, so that was on the, uh, I believe, the 3rd of June... You know, 2nd of June. So people start like, oh, fucking hell, Taylor Lorenz is at it again. Taylor Lorenz is, like, lying again. Taylor Lorenz is about to get us into some drama again. So while that goes on, just unrelated, <laughs> but both happen to be at the Washington Post. Let me give you a reminder <clears throat> about who Felicia Sonmez is. Now, I know you know her. You don't know you know her, but you do know her. Because do you remember on that shocking day that Kobe Bryant... And his daughter died in that helicopter accident. You might remember, like, how, you know, just what a weird, tragic, and awful day that was for many of us. Well, uh, there was one journalist uh, at the Washington Post that basically tweeted out, while people were still uncertain as to what had happened, his wife was battling with TMZ, there was a lot of stuff going on. There was one journalist that decided to tweet out, essentially, you know, listen, hey, Kobe Bryant and his daughter are dead and everything, but you remember that time he was accused of rape? That was her hot take on that day, that was the way she decided to go viral, while uh, an icon and uh, his child lay dead in flaming wreckage. That was what she thought was important at that moment in time. How can I make it about me? The first thought the American journalist has. She ended up deleting all of those tweets, if you remember. And, and oh, initially she defended it. She said, any uh, public figure is worth remembering in totality. And then she also linked to another public opinion from like another journalist from back in the day. So, you know, look, listen, I also will just add to this. I don't think she should have necessarily been suspended which she was, but I'll also add, I think if you're a major journalistic publication and, there, and you set your journalist behavioral standards, this is certainly worth looking at because there is a conversation to be had about, well, look, just because someone has died, we shouldn't worship them and, 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 and suddenly pretend that they were good people if they weren't. No one should be kind of forced to pretend somebody was better than what they were in death. But the, the issue here is obviously sh the timing and the fact there's a child involved and, and that the details were unclear and everything else she basically did something that i think was probably worthy of 
you know, at least a rebuke privately because it doesn't help the publication. So it was also worth noting there was like an, intellig an intelligencer article at that time. And uh, you can see here, uh, the broader newsroom knew few of these details at the time of Barron's listening tour. Many staffers were unaware the post-op editors had long believed that Sonmez was undermining its attempts to cover the news objectively. And that her tweet about Brian, which ran against the hagiographic coverage of his life and career, was for them a final straw. So what was going on at the Washington Post? The Washington Post were like, they were quickly cobbling together like, you know, Kobe Bryant, here's all the good stuff he did. Kobe Bryant, a career in pictures. Kobe Bryant, America mourns. What next for the Lakers? You know, how are they going to honor his memory? Um, you know, all, you know all this stuff they were pulling together to honor, a, a, like you know, a, a, like say an icon, a sporting icon. Meanwhile, one of their journalists is tweeting, "Yeah, he was a cunt though, wasn't he? And he did get accused that one time, so probably bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you 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 attacking me for being insensitive? Well, bloody hell, you're all just sexist, aren't you? So a lot of people at the post got mega mega pissed off with her at that time. Now this then leads into she decided that she was going to. Uh, sue the Washington Post over gender discrimination. Now, this this case is like insanely convoluted and complicated. But let me just give you uh, the the broad strokes of this. She had at the LA Times accused another journalist of sexual assault. The journalist denied it. They did an investigation. LA Times fired the journalist that was accused and that was supposedly the end of it. There was no action. There was no like police, you know, no criminal proceedings, no civil, you know, proceedings or anything like that. And eventually she leaves the LA Times after that and then ends up joining the Washington Post. But you can see uh, when she joined the Washington Post initially, and they were like, we're happy to have you on board, Felicia, she wanted to continually talk about what happened at the LA Times and how she didn't think the LA Times had been very supportive and how that journalist had got away with it, even though he'd been fired. And again, I, I don't know the facts of the matter in the case. If he did assault her, obviously, it's it's indefensible. It doesn't matter you know, how much of an asshole she's being a day. That's completely inexcusable, and no human being should have to go through that. But I don't know the facts of the matter. I don't know if this is a, a false allegation allegation or actually you know something uh, that that happened but anyway so this was in 2018 and so she, all she wanted to publicly talk about while working at what the washington post was how her former employees employers the la times had let her down and so the the editors said listen it's it's a terrible look for us because there are you know they're not a rival publication because they're not like on a national scale in the same way. But, you know, we all play in the same ball pit. You know, it's terrible what happened to you. We're really, really uh, sorry and everything. But can you can you not keep tweeting about them? It would really help us out. Then the Kavanaugh story happened. Now you remember the Kavanaugh story, the Brett Kavanaugh story. This was when Kavanaugh was meant to be confirmed to the Supreme Court. And in what is one of the most pathetic smear attempts with absolutely zero factual basis whatsoever, the DNC machine cobbled together lies that all revolved around Christine Blasey Ford, a discredited witness, uh, someone who claimed witnesses would corroborate her story with that those witnesses then didn't she couldn't remember material details of the assault and it was basically a fucking show trial for a republican because the democrats were worried about the supreme court being packed with republicans on the basis it might lead to things like the ridiculous decision we've had of late but anyway during the kavanaugh coverage she decided to talk about her experience. She wanted to talk about her experiences. And she told people, you know, at work, they were aware of what happened at the LA Times. And she said like, oh God, you know, that Brett Kavanaugh story, it's brought a lot back for me. And, and she had to go uh, for a walk. You can see here uh, in a suit, she says the Kavanaugh story threw her for a loop. She took a walk around the block. She was asked about it subsequently by an editor and acknowledged she had to take a moment to gather herself by re before reporting on the Kavanaugh story but then she said 
the fact that she had to take a walk around the block was used against her by her bosses. It, she was blocked from covering Kavanaugh, blocked from covering other stories involving Me Too and sexual harassment, or even more serious and sexual assault allegations. She argues this cost her a number of stories, it cost her professional opportunities, it cost her evaluations for a job, it cost her TV gigs, and also in a significant way, she alleges it hurt her psychological well-being. Now listen, I'll just add, if you come at it from that angle, that, oh, I said I had to take a walk on a block and I was really, like, disturbed and I didn't want to report on it, and then they ban me from reporting on it, you might go, your initial thought might be, well, yeah, that sounds plausible, that might be bias. Here's another way of looking at it, right? And as we'll get to, you can probably have an inkling about which way it was viewed. Uh, another way uh, of looking at it, right, is that if you, if you're a journalist, and I, I'm an editor, and I give you a story, and it's about something triggering you know like sexual assault or you know murder or you know whatever it is it relates to your personal experience in a way that it brings back trauma and you leave the office you have to get away from the story uh, maybe you even blow a deadline over it because you just can't handle reporting on it and then you come back and you go look sorry uh it just brought a lot of things back for me but i'm gonna be okay now what i might do as an editor to try and support you is ensure you don't cover that type of story again because i don't want you to have a negative psychological response and that by the way i imagine would be considered a supportive gesture not something worth uh kind of condemnation for not an allegation of sexism not somebody saying like oh you're a bad person and you're ruining my career no i'm trying to help you i don't want you to experience that repressed trauma plenty of news out there it doesn't have to be the thing that hurts and upsets you so you know that's another framing isn't it that's another way of looking at it now what ended up happening with felicia sonmez is that lawsuit got just it got dismissed and it got dismissed pretty quickly as soon as it went to the judge so this you can see here court dismisses washington post's reporters lawsuit against the paper and its former top editor a judge in washington dc on thursday dismissed a high profile case filed by a washington post politics reporter who alleged that the newspaper and its former top editor subjected her to unlawful discrimination after she publicly said she'd been the victim of sexual assault sonmez's lawyer said in the suit she had suffered economic loss humiliation embarrassment mental and emotional distress and the deprivation of her rights to equal employment opportunities but on thursday her case was dismissed with prejudice uh, meaning it cannot be refiled by judge anthony c epstein that's an unfortunate name all things considered of the superior court of the district of california's civil division Epstein ruled that Sonmez had failed to state an actionable claim. The facts alleged by Miss Sonmez do not support a plausible inference that the Post discriminated against her or created a hostile work environment wholly or partially because she is the victim of sexual assault or a woman. The Post attributed all of their employment actions about which Miss Sonmez complains to her public statements, not to her victim's status or sex. Its stated reason, avoiding the appearance of a perception of bias by its reporter, is a basis for the bans that does not implicate the Human Rights Act. So, a judge just said, like, you have no case. These complaints don't hold up. You aren't being uh, oppressed because you're a woman your editors are making a decision to remove you from stories in case some bias leaks through which is kind of hilarious when you consider the washington post allows all other kinds of bias to fucking leak through not least of all our old friend taylor lorenz we were just talking about with the emphasis being on the word old so that's who felicia is that's all you need to know there felicia somers it's actually staggering to me she still has a job at the post or actually as you're about to find out she doesn't now but did up until today for me what you also have to remember is that during the height of her complaint when she wanted to make a stronger case for herself get as much money as she could on the way out of the fucking washington post out of the washington post she literally leaked business emails she literally leaked professional emails to the main rival the new york times the new york times and the washington post are both national desks they're both rivals she leaked emails so they could report on what a terrible time she was having and it's like that to me is a dismissible offense right there it's pretty open it's you know but no not a not a big deal these emails could only have come from her is what they decided and as we're about to get to it is worth noting that despite all of this stuff despite the fact that she was suspended for the kobe Bryant tweets despite the fact that she'd done the you know everything else dave weagle 
or Weigel, I guess it might be pronounced, is another journalist at the Washington Post, currently suspended for a month without pay. But you can see he supported her when she came back from suspension in 2020. Now, loyalty gets you nothing in this world. So let's go back, back in time, and to the 3rd of June. That Taylor Loren story that I showed you is doing the rounds. It's the day after. And as you can see, here he is. This is the guy that was mentioned in the story. Uh, that umbrella guy. The Washington Post lied and did not contact me before including me in, in their story on Johnny Depp, despite the reporting that they did. I noted this on Twitter today at 8.31. At 9.44, they decided to contact me after I noted this publicly. And you can see here, I... Hi there, it's Taylor Lorenz with the catfish picture. I'm a reporter at the Washington Post and wanted to reach out to see if you'd be interested in letting us know how much you made recently on your YouTube channel. Right now, you've mentioned in a stat, in a story about the Depp versus Herd coverage saying that according to an estimate by social analytics firm Social Blade, you potentially made $80,000 last month. And you can see, by the way, there's the timestamp at the top, 9.44. And here he is after the report went public at 8.31. Looks like that umbrella guy made the Washington Post because dedicated pro depth content. Nice how they speculate at what I made in one month, by the way, but omit years of coverage. I'd like to see proof that Washington Post reached out to me because I got no emails or Twitter DMs. Now, he wasn't the only one in the story that also was not reached out to because Taylor Lorenz won't even do the basics and the bare minimum uh, of, of journalism. This is uh, me Mediaites coverage here. And you can see two YouTubers accused Taylor Lorenz of falsely claiming she reached out uh, for comment on Depp Heard story. And of course, she absolutely didn't do that. And they both had proof. They both had the receipts. So the Washington Post were like, fucking hell, we're about to get tailored again. Why, why does this always happen on every story she reports? They're beating the drums about how it's going to uh, get ready, get ready. We'll say it's Tucker Carlson's fault, you know what I mean? Not hers for not doing her job properly. We'll wait until it goes on Tucker Carlson and we'll say she's being bullied and attacked and it's terrible what women face in, uh, in, in the world of journalism. But while that happened, there was a bad tweet. Oh, a bad, bad tweet. Now, I'm going to give you a trigger warning. Sexism about to happen. A bad tweet. There it is, right. This is from a random Twitter account. Every girl is bi. You just have to figure out if it's polar or sexual. Right, that's the tweet. Okay, that's the bad tweet. Now, obviously, if that was made as a statement of fact, that would be sexist and misogynistic. If Bill Burr said that on stage, you double up with, with laughter. And I want you to think about all of the terrible, tired comedy we've plowed through courtesy of Mr. Gervais. So that was the tweet, and you can see David Weigel has retweeted it, hasn't he? He's retweeted the bad tweet. Which now, by the way, just so you know, the standard is you don't even have to tweet the bad thing. You can like or retweet the bad thing. And that's enough for you. This guy's fine. The guy who said it, fine. No one even knows who he is, fine. He just gets on with his life. The person that retweeted it, life's over. You're a sexist now. And Felicia... Wasted no time at all. She saw the bad tweet, the bad retweet, I should say, and went fantastic to work at a news outlet where retweets like this are allowed. Now, you have to wonder with the timing, with the Taylor Lorenz thing, whether this was like a contrived thing. I don't even think it was. I don't think Felicia Somers was like going, no, and like trying to jump on the fucking grenade to stop Taylor Lorenz getting in trouble for journalistic malpractice for like the sixth time. You know, I don't think she was doing that. But, you know, the timing's interesting. I just think the Washington Post is a fucking dumpster fire. I think it's full of children. I think it's full of emotional children and people who aren't fit to wear the title of journalist. That's what I think. Dave Weigel knows. Shit, they've got me. They've got me with a bad retweet. Fuck, Twitter's the most important thing on planet Earth. They've got me, haven't they? So he decides uh, to do the apology. Uh, he's got to apologize. You must, you must apologize, David. You must apologize. Failure to apologize uh, will result in your career being over. So he decides 
to apologize. I just removed a retweet of an offensive joke. I apologize and did not mean to cause any harm. Now that should be the end of it, uh, shouldn't it? But no, the Twitterati are all over it now, mate. There's no grace for you. No grace for you. Uh, and also, yes, just as a rule of thumb, never apologize, never explain. It's a waste of time anyway. All it does is show weakness. All it does is show that you're going to buckle. And so they just pile on more. It's kind of like it's kind of like begging for mercy while someone's beating you up. Just just fade into unconsciousness and say nothing. They're only going to hit you harder. And you can see underneath, I'm genuinely curious. What did you find funny about it? And what made you think it was a good idea to retweet it? Because there was a thought process involved. Now, the inner workings of your brain uh, must be laid bare for me to judge. Uh, Amy Siskind, absolutely awful, a, a regular in uh, Enemy of the People. You are still misogynistic trash. Uh, can't believe Washington Post still employs someone with such deep-seated sexist beliefs. Remember, didn't write the tweet. Uh, definitely clouds his ability to report unbiased facts. And listen, in the same way that maybe you rebuke Felicia for saying, remember Kobe Bryant was a bad person while his, you know, while the people still haven't recovered his body. Uh, maybe you say, maybe don't tweet that. Maybe you do have a word with David, don't you? And you say, maybe don't retweet that in your position, eh? You know, it's not, it's not a comedy club. You're a journalist. Uh, anyway, you can see here the Washington Post suspended him over sexist retweet. That's how it's framed. I personally think it's more to do with, it's probably more offensive to people with mental health problems and bipolar, but maybe. Take your pick, I guess. It, it, it's a double, du one of those double whammy jokes, isn't it? The Washington Post has suspended reporter David Weigel for one month without pay for retweeting a sexist joke. Two people familiar with the matter told CNN on Monday. Weigel did not respond for a request for comment, but an out-of-office reply from his post email address said he would return to work on July 5th. Weigel apologised publicly last week for the retweet, saying he didn't mean to cause any harm. Weigel's retweet was spotlighted publicly by his colleague, um, Felicia Sommez who recently had a discrimination lawsuit against the paper dismissed. It's almost as if this was part of some sort of wider plan, isn't it? To get paid. Uh, what do I know? Uh, a decision, her attorney said she plans to appeal. Some men sarcastically wrote on Twitter on Friday. Oh, there you go. <laughs> There's the smoking gun right there. She can't refile the lawsuit, but she can appeal the decision, I suppose. Sonmez sarcastically wrote on Twitter, it's fantastic to work at a news outlet where retweets like this are allowed. So there you go. Ease out. He's out for a month. And what's also really interesting is just to remind you uh, that when one of her colleagues had tweeted something biased about Joe Biden and Trump and got fired, she ran to defend that journalist. The one, I think she featured on another stream or another video. It was, um, what is it, Lauren Wolf or Penny Wolf? Anyway, whatever. She was the one who basically like had some fucking beta orbiter create like a tweet thread about, and she's lost her job and she won't be able to feed her dog. Look at her dog, her dog might die. Surely just because she did a tweet, a dog doesn't deserve, it was pathetic. One of the worst things I've ever seen. Anyway, if a tweet truly crosses the line, it should lead to discussion with editors, not a scramble to fire the writer due to fear. The person most harmed in this case, obviously, is Wolf321. But every time a news org caves to an online harassment campaign, we're all less safe. Except the harassment campaigns run by Felicia Sonmez. That was the 3rd of June. Now, meanwhile, while that's going on, the absolute nightmare dumpster fire that is Taylor Lorenz is reporting, this is causing problems because, as you saw on the third, people are going, listen, I, we, you didn't reach out for comment, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. So the Washington Post is having to do something that, you know, all good publications have to do. They want to issue corrections. So first, just to give you some chronology, and this might get confusing, some of these tweets might overlap because it was a mess. The first thing they did was they stealth edited it. They just did a stealth edit to basically cover up for Taylor Lorenz. And somebody had archived it and gone, uh, you have edited it now to make it look like she did do the thing she objectively lied about. So then they put in a tiny correction and went, listen, they said they reached out for comment, but they hadn't. Our bad. Then somebody went, yeah, but actually she's still lying about it now. 
and then they went, okay, don't worry, we'll put in a much longer comment. So, uh, uh, correction. So, this is the second correction. The first published version of this story stated incorrectly that internet influencers, Elite Mazika, and that umbrella guy had been contacted for comment before publication. In fact, only Mazika was asked via Instagram after the story was published. Now, by the way, that's disputed, <laughs> as we'll get to. It was just a fucking DM on an Instagram account sent. Anyway, the, the post continued to seek comment from Mazika via social media and queried that umbrella guy for the first time. During that process, the post removed the incorrect statement from the story, but did not note its removal, a violation of our corrections policy. The story has been updated to note that Mazika declined to comment for the story and that umbrella guy could not be reached for comment. A previous version of this story also inaccurately attributed a quote to Adam Waldman, a lawyer for Johnny Depp. The quote described how he contacted some internet influencers and has been removed. Like, seriously. If, you, if, if this is the type of correction you're having to issue, the journalist that is doing these things, forcing you to issue these corrections, multiple corrections, super lengthy, do you just you just fire them? You say, L listen, I, I don't know what you learned in journal, but this is like meant to be one of the best newspapers in the world. Uh, you're clearly not ready for this. You need to, you know, maybe we can farm you out to like one of our local newspapers as a training exercise for a year, but this isn't going to fly at the Washington Post. Just to also underline it, there was confirmation here you can see one of the best accounts on twitter red stees the national review a publication often dismissed as a right-wing rag doing the type of reporting the washington post didn't want to do they tracked down both of them and mazaika said i can confirm that she did not reach out to me until i called her out on twitter after i did she reached out to me by twitter dm providing a phone number for me to call her at some time she never attempted to make an appointment or to facilitate a specific time to talk about the article next up additionally and i think importantly she also left out the name of my channel and the fact that i'm an attorney if she had included the name of my channel it would have been clear that it isn't so out of character for me to cover something like the debt versus her trial because i cover lawsuits and trials all of the time yes indeed she did deliberately misrepresent you then came another update to the correction a recorrection of a recorrection uh this was uh noticed by uh, jerry dunlevy you can see here this oh no rather he was saying this correction now needs to be corrected based on the reporting that was done in the national review because when you go over here right taylor loren said last thursday an incorrect line uh, was added to a story of mine before publishing due to miscommunication with an editor after the story went live i reached out to both youtubers mentioned in that sentence and of course that's not what happened uh, she just can't help herself so then i think this was the channel again complaining that the correction the recorrection of the correction was still wrong you, you can see here this is the channel legal bites what washington post i will say this again i was not reached out to by taylor lorenz for comment until after my tweet below she reached out to me by instagram dm after she did on twitter both dms were sent to me after i called her out here and of course you just saw from the correction the washington post refused to acknowledge that fact then in true taylor lorenz fashion she could have just said look Maybe I got a bit ahead of myself with the story. I should have reached out for comment. My bad. It's not like anyone's going to do anything to you. You've got the right politics. You're safe. You can be, you know, the journalistic clique will fucking walk around you. But what's really interesting is, I think you're starting to see some of the more traditional journalists. Like, Oliver Darcy, by the way, is a fucking dunderhead and a piece of shit. And he's in Enemy of the People loads because he's just, he was a, he was a grifter. He was an anti-Trump grifter. He posted multiple false stories. Uh, he, he's just, he's just ridiculous ridiculous um you know but he can acknowledge like at least the basics of journalism were not enacted here and there's something very weird about not being able to accept that you got something wrong and so you are starting to see these journalistic factions to kind of like fight against each other they're all liars they're all garbage they're all the enemy of the people they're all gonna lie to you they all work for corporate media they've been bought and sold many times over that's all true but some are gonna be better than others and taylor lorenz is the bottom of the barrel absolute trash tier so anyway Taylor Lorenz went on this, like, mad diatribe. So here you go. I'll, I'll read it to you. I uh, read part of it earlier, but I'll read you the full thing. She blames her editors for her not doing her due diligence. Last Thursday, an incorrect line was added to a story of mine. Apparently, the editors, apropos of nothing, decided to add that she had indeed reached out for comment. 
out of the blue bizarre an incorrect line was added to a story of mine before publishing due to a miscommunication with an editor i did not write the line and was not aware it was inserted i asked for it to be removed right after the story went live the line was a sentence saying that i reached out to two youtubers for comment on my story the inclusion of the youtubers was only in passing citing another outlet's reporting after the story went live, I reached out to both YouTubers mentioned in that sentence just to be sure there wasn't some sort of commentary they wanted to add. Neither provided comment for the story and both continued to post about me. The mention of these two individuals was not remotely the focus of my story. It's become a huge distraction. I spoke to over two dozen creators for my story about the trial, along with other experts who were quoted in the piece, including the one you had to change the quote for, uh, quote for because you incorrectly attributed it. This should have been a small correction for a miscommunication, but it turned into a multi-day media cycle, intentionally aimed at discrediting the Washington Post and me. We have a responsibility to recognise these bad faith campaigns for what they are. Remember that phrase, bad faith, told you strong uptake for that these days. Uh, and when these sort of things do and do not warrant acknowledgement. I'm extremely happy at the Washington Post. I chose to work here because it's a really incredible place filled with amazing, talented journalists and editors. Bad actors recognize the Washington Post's earnest desire to hear and incorporate feedback, and they exploit that. I know that the stuff I write about and go through is hugely unfamiliar to the vast majority of people in media. I have great hope that all of us can learn from this experience. Only me, Taylor Lorenz, can accurately write about TikTok, uh, that incredible, important uh, platform for zoomers with no attention spam then she also wanted to make it abundantly clear that if you pointed out she had been caught in a lie yet again after reporting a story and was now blaming her editors for that lie it's right wing here you go in response to oliver darcy's coverage of her bullshit no actually this type of coverage is so irresponsible and dangerous it's misrepresenting my words to amplify a manufactured outrage campaign by right-wing media and radicalized influencers which is driving a vicious harassment and smear campaign against me cnn is gleefully piling on yeah that's right cnn are now the right wing radicalized influencers coming to get taylor lorenz good old cnn who knew she also attacked brian stelter yes the king of the potato peoples here worship thy king bow before thy liege king of the potato people brian stelter what oliver darcy is doing is standard reporting he sent legitimate questions to the post and the post responded scrutiny by two fellow journalists is not the same as a smear campaign by crusaders steve mullis a uh, sort of uh, orbiter came in and went that's not the point you've been in journalism for how long you know editorial miscommunications and mistakes happen the issue was turning a mundane correction into a scandal because bad faith folks on the internet are implying there is something more nefarious going on maybe if this wasn't like i said the sixth time she'd been caught doing this and lying like this then perhaps there would be more good faith but there isn't is there and then taylor lorenz replies because brian knows that he just does not care. The king of the potato people from the top rope. This is all on the same day, by the way. This is all June 4th. Then she also went on to sort of underline that, look, everyone else in the industry is wrong. Not Taylor. People pointing out that this is journalistic malpractice, they're wrong. She's right. Uh, we must stop rewarding bad actors and emboldening them. That's why educating newsrooms about this stuff is so crucial. She's the authority. She's the person that can educate a newsroom. Can't actually ask for comment before publishing a story. Lies about it, then blames the editors for that lie. So, at best, she didn't do her due diligence. Even if her version is true, she still failed journalism 101. Uh, but no, she's the person... To to talk about uh, educating the newsroom and she added it's a deep ignorance coupled with a superiority complex so many in media have not like taylor she definitely doesn't have a superiority complex having just declared herself the only person that really understands the modern media landscape uh, that makes so many reporters unfit to cover today's media landscape there you go i mean the the, the stupefying lack of self-awareness in that tweet uh, in and of itself is uh, ridiculous and let me also just add this uh this was how we rounded out 
the delightful day of June fourth uh, in the uh, in the kindergarten uh, aspect. The Felicia Sonmez story was still percolating away and about to get into high gear. Uh, the newsroom divided, even though David Weigel had been suspended by this point. She said, "As Felicia's colleague, I'm glad she calls out misogyny instead of catering to men's fragile feelings and lack of empathy." To which Felicia said, "Thank you." prayer emoji nina this means so much thank you now what's interesting with that is of course by making a broad sweeping statement about men and whether or not they have f fragile feelings and men we're incapable of empathy apparently uh because we're not human i guess what you've done there is also violated washington post's uh policies behavioral standards for journalists by making a sweeping sexist statement not unlike the original joke about women uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that that uh, sort of hasn't been uh, paid attention to. But what do I know? Again, I'm not, I am not. couldn't run a newsroom. I'm a moron. So we then get into June the 5th. Yes, this goes on for days. Uh, you can see Felicia Somers decided to start June 5th by really, you know, talking about the important stuff of the day. How she's being oppressed. Help, help. I'm being oppressed. Help. When women stand up for themselves, some people respond with even more vitriol. Last night, a post co a colleague publicly attacked me for calling out another colleague's sexist tweet. He first hid any replies objecting to his attacks and now seems to have deleted his account. Um, so you can see here, this is Jose A. A. Del Real. Felicia, we all mess up from time to time. This is what he said publicly. Another journalist at the post. Engaging in repeated and targeted public harassment of a colleague is neither a good look, nor is it particularly effective. It turns the language of inclusivity into clout chasing and bullying. I don't think this is appropriate. Well, good on you, Jose. And then look, after this, fighting sexism and misogyny deeply matters to me. I will always admire your bravery in sharing your story, and I support your fight against retribution for doing so. Entirely separately, I hope you reconsider the cruelty you regularly unleash against colleagues. Then, she said, you know, obviously as well, all the stuff that's going on at the WAPO, it doesn't just apply to women, it goes to racism and LGBT." Q discrimination and denigration of any marginalized group and she and uh, jose said i reject your attempt to make a specific critique of your regular public bullying into a sweeping opera about principles as i said weigel's retweet was offensive and should be called out it was strongly condemned internally so i'm confused about your implication otherwise this was the damning attack that poor felicia had to endure from jose a. del real so she had to drag him Objecting to sexism is not clout chasing. It's not harassment. And it's certainly not cruelty. Does the Washington Post agree? She tags in the bosses, Sally Busby. Here is a personal thread I wrote last night about why speaking out matters. And that includes like just some misogynistic abuse from total strangers on the internet, not related to the inner workings of the Washington Post newsroom. I realized I had inadvertently forgot to include this tweet in which my colleague again objects to me publicly objecting to a public sexist tweet. I can see there, Jose. Uh, it says, Dave's retweet is terrible and unacceptable, but rallying the internet to attack him for a mistake he made doesn't solve anything. We all mess up in some way or another. There, there is such a thing as challenging with compassion. Jose, let me lecture you now, right? As a white, liberal, female journalist. Him, by the way, if you don't know Jose A. Del Real, uh, I believe he's of uh, in a, he's an American Mexican descent. Yeah, I think he's an openly bisexual individual. Certainly, if we're going to play the oppression Olympics, uh, it, it, he I I can imagine him having much more marginalised um, uh, experiences. But I'll also add, if you live in uh, America and you get to work for the Washington Post and make six figure salaries doing so, you are in the one percent and you are some of the most privileged people to exist on the planet right now. So you know, just to put it all in perspective for everyone. Dave's retweet was indeed terrible and unacceptable. It was also public, and it's important that all those who see Dave's tweet also see Washington Post reports standing up for our newspaper's values, one of which is that comments denigrating women will not be tolerated. You may view it as a simple matter of someone messing up. I view it differently. My timeline this past day has been full of women, reporters, readers, sources, wondering whether this means they can trust the Washington Post to report on them and for them, of course. Absurd if you even would assume someone retweeting a joke means that journalists no longer advocate for 50% of the planet. 
And Jose A. Del Real just tweeted out at the end before peacing out for a bit. I've had a long week and made the mistake of logging into Twitter. What a horror show. <laughs> Can everyone just be kind to each other? No. Also as well, uh, this is uh, from his side of the, the tweeting. He said, last night I came under an unrelenting series of attacks intended to tarnish my professional reputation and personal reputation. The cause, some tweets I sent calling for compassion within our workplace. Those attacks continued this morning. In hopes of de-escalating, I temporarily deactivated my account amid a barrage of online abuse directed by one person but carried out by an eager mob. The one-sided attacks continued even after I stopped engaging. I know the old adage, hurt people hurt people. But what then? In such a situation, it is difficult to find the line between sympathising and challenging with compassion. My instinct is to defend myself. But I talk a big game about kindness, and I'm going to try and practice some of that now by simply moving on and not engaging. I will just say that I am proud to be part of a workplace here. Contrary to the impression created on this forum, many people actively engaged in the work of dismantling systems of sexism, racism, and homophobia. Sometimes that work is loud, and sometimes it is quiet. As the only Mexican-American reporter on the national desk, I know the sting of discriminatory systems firsthand. Anyone who wants you to believe they are alone and trying to fix it is doing a disservice to the amazing team effort unfolding, of which I'm proud to be a part of. I'll end where I began. Let's be kind to each other. I really believe empathy Empathy is a necessary tool in this effort to improve our workplaces and our culture. We can all be better. I certainly will continue trying to be. It's all right, Jose. I like you. You might be a blue check journalist, but you're all right in my book. Terminally online, though, for sure. So at this point on the 5th of June, the boss, the person who's got to rein in and wrangle these fucking children into some sort of case of newsroom, uh, Sally Busby, sends a memo out, right? And the memo says... Colleagues, <laughs> respect and kindness being the subject. Colleagues, we expect the staff to treat each other with respect and kindness both in the newsroom and online. We are a collegial and creative newsroom doing an astonishing amount of important and groundbreaking journalism. One of the great strengths of our newsroom is our collaborative can't even speak collaborative spirit the washington post is committed to an inclusive and respectful environment free of harassment discrimination or bias of any sort when issues arise please raise them with the leadership or human resources and we will address them promptly and firmly in other words yes don't air your dirty laundry in public twitter is not the washington post if somebody's done something behaviorally wrong raise it with the people at your business yes good advice now you would think that would be the end of the Felicia Somers saga, but just hold that thought because we have to jump back across. It's June 6th. Here's Taylor Lorenz and Palmer Lucky. You may remember Palmer Lucky. Palmer Lucky was the guy who was over at like fucking Facebook Oculus working on VR. And I think he'd like donated to a Republican one time. So basically all of the media at that time decided to dogpile him and destroy him and say he was weird and fucking QAnon or whatever it was, pre-QAnon or whatever. Basically, he was a Trump supporter working in tech and working for a big company, so he had to be absolutely destroyed. And it was really weird. I can't remember anything he was supposed to have done, particularly. memory. Maybe I'm forgetting something really heinous. But, you know, that, that was sort of my memory of the situation. So anyway, he came out on the 6th and said, listen, the Taylor Lorenz post-correction scandal isn't the isolated incident apologists claim. When I was fired, her story said I had announced I was leaving Oculus, but this was false. It wasn't my choice, nor my announcement. Her only source was Facebook PR. The Washington Post later published a story claiming I hid political contributions using shell companies. Yeah, that was it. And refused to comment. This was also false. It was a single do donation from a regular company, and they didn't reach out to me until 5.54 a.m., seven minutes before the story went to print. When I publicly called them out for this, they said the note regarding comment was technically true, <laughs> and that they would only edit the story if I provided the Washington Post with detailed financials proving my helicopter business isn't a shell corporation. They then deleted everything with no disclosure. At some point, someone must have realized that they shouldn't have just made things up without any evidence. These hoity-toity papers love to crow about truth and justice when they correct tiny things like misspellings, but major wrongdoings are, are regularly papered over without fuss. Uh, people are accusing me of hating journalists or not understanding how their job works. I studied journalism in college for three years before I dropped out to start Oculus. I was the online editor of the Daily 49 at our school paper. I don't hate journalism. I hate bad journalism and so you can see here 
uh, Taylor tweeted at him saying, what story of mine are you talking about? I don't cover Oculus and never have. There it is. And he said, Taylor responded asking what story I'm talking about and claiming it would have never covered Oculus. I would have thought given a specific date, topic, and excerpt was enough. Apparently not. And you can see he literally gives the story. Now, what I was able to do with that information, and maybe I got lucky because obviously Taylor is definitely... Uh, a better uh, journalist than me but what i was able to do with the headline and the contents and the date i was actually able to find the story that taylor lorenz uh did cover in fact i you know i must have looked out with it just one of those things there it is oculus vr found a palmer lucky leaving facebook taylor lorenz 2017 but she never she never she never covered it so once again caught publicly lying these things used to be disqualifying for journalists not these days you can lie and lie and lie and lie and keep your six-figure salary jobs uh, and everyone just yums it up no one has a problem with it but yes she absolutely did cover it there's the story there's taylor lorenz that's her byline it's exactly the story as described by palmer lucky that's exactly it but here's the other problem this is the part of it like this is how much of a fucking insane liar she is this is how deranged this individual is right how would you forget this by the way taken from her own social media hang on that's the wrong link taken from her own social media right this is on her personals sort of looks to me like she's covering oculus here said haven't tried oculus since last year but got to demo samsung's gear vr today and holy fuck it was so cool vr's the future y'all 2015 so there she is. Also, by the way, this is 2015. Those are not the hands of, of a 28-year-old. <laughs> Just an observation. Just an observation that I've made. Anyway, we then skip into the 7th of June. Now, the problem with the 7th of June is, obviously, Felicia Sonmez hasn't been in the spotlight for a little bit because we're all getting bent out of shape by this habitual liar that is Taylor Lorenz. So, obviously... This is Felicia going absolutely mental with a one. This is when you know someone's fucking off the deep end. When you see the one slash X, I am going to tweet endlessly about this. That you, you, that's when you just have to log. You have to tell them log off, log off, slash X, log off. If you're ever typing that. But no, on and on and on it goes. Uh, it's talking about, you know, all the things that went on, uh, all the changes, uh, reports you social media as an outlet, blah, 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 blah. Look at, look at this. Just look how she's talking about how terrible it was, how everything bad was happened to her, how she was bilked and had her job taken away. And then uh, it ends here and goes, uh, these days I bike by, uh, not the post old office, but a hotel in my neighborhood where I hid for days after being doxxed and suspended in January 2020, talking about the Kobe Bryant tweet. Apparently she claimed that she was doxxed and harassed. I often hear from colleagues who want to say something but are afraid to speak out, knowing how the post punished me for my own trauma and how a colleague publicly accused me of bullying for flagging a sexist tweet. I don't blame them for being afraid of retaliation some post employees have even flagged problematic tweets before only to be told by editors that they weren't an issue so at this point sally busby the boss that we saw back on the fifth she's like for fuck's sake and obviously this is all angling from felicia somers to basically you know gin up the strength of her lawsuit and hopefully get a big big fat payment and so sally busby sent a stern memo this time kindness and respect didn't work let's all be nice we all work together let's keep it internal that didn't work so let's issue another one here is the uh, memo in question dear colleagues in this newsroom we share many important common values a belief in the power of journalism hatred of racist or sexist behavior language or systems a conviction that when people come together in good faith with respect and trust it creates an environment that enables each person to do powerful and important work we also occasionally disagree we come from different backgrounds and experiences and we each see the world differently. That combination of shared values and diversity of viewpoints is our greatest strength. So today, in the strongest of terms, I want to reiterate the importance of the following policies, which we will enforce. We do not tolerate colleagues attacking colleagues, either face to face or online. Respect for others is critical to any civil society, including our newsroom. The newsroom social media policy points specifically to the need for collegiality. 
We also do not tolerate violations of our policy prohibiting workplace harassment and our policy on prohibition of discrimination, which further set forth our expectations for employees and are designed to create an inclusive environment where all post employees can perform their best work. In the last year, we have been forced through conversations, mediation and disciplinary measures, egregious violations of our social media policy, just as we have enforced our overall standards. As we have said, we plan to update the social media policy. Until then, the current policy remains in effect. It states, when it comes to your colleagues, be constructive and collegial. If you have a question or concern about something that has been published, speak to your colleague directly. We respect and do not wish to inhibit any employee's right to raise legitimate workplace issues. We know it takes bravery to call out problems. And we pledge to openly and honestly address problems brought to us. We moved quickly to show our intolerance for a sexist retweet sent by an employee last Friday. To be clear, we will enforce our policies and standards. Each day, this newsroom creates groundbreaking journalism that the world desperately needs. God, aren't you the real heroes? We also work each day to improve as a workplace, to be more inclusive, more fair, more rigorous, more ambitious, and proud of each of you and your work. All the best, Sally. Now, far be it from me to suggest this shows some sort of absolutely pet petulant behaviour on behalf of the journalists. Many of the people at the Post decided to just sort of publicly echo the key words from Sally Busby's memo in public. Ashley Parker. The Post is not perfect, no institution is, but I'm proud of my work here. I love coming to work almost every single day and knowing that my colleagues are collegial, collaborative and fun humans. Not to mention talented journalists who are always striving to do better. No institution is perfect, including The Post, but the place is filled with many terrific people who are smart and collegial. I'm proud to work here. The Post is a place that is always striving to be better than it was yesterday, but it's a collaborative institution with good people who work hard to do important journalism together. I'm proud to work here. The Washington Post newsroom is filled with collegial, collaborative and respectful journalists who do critically important work every day. I'm immensely proud to work here. Mature. Yesterday, the 8th of June. Just to draw your attention to the fact that the Washington Post newsroom, as I said, it is, a, to call it high school is doing it too much justice. It is a kindergarten. But you can see here that in response to that memo that went out, you may remember Brianna Muir. Brianna Muir was someone that got very upset because somebody accidentally tweeted at her. And it was at the time when the Brianna Taylor story was doing the news rounds. And someone had a brain fart and said, oh yeah, we've got fantastic uh, staff here like Brianna Taylor. When they meant Brianna Muir. And because of that, that was racism, sexism, lack of respect, prejudice, er everything else. All of the things. All of, uh, She was very upset about that. And you can see she replied to Sally in a now leaked memo because obviously as well, all these things are getting leaked. Uh, does your company social media policy not apply to Lisa Rain for telling Felicia Sommes to stop it on Twitter? In all honesty, her comment doesn't sound collegial to me. And you can see here, this was the comment. When it comes to your colleagues, be constructive and collegial. If you have a question or concern, that's something directly. And then a few people have been telling Felicia, stop tweeting about it. Please stop tweeting. Please log off. Time out, time out. I don't understand how speaking out against sexism, discrimination and unequal tweet treatment happening here. Tweetment is probably the right word. Happening here in our newsroom is wrong. It's unjust that our newsroom is failing to acknowledge and allowing this type of behaviour. I thought the Post took pride in telling the truth and would never try to cover it up. Well, yeah, you can tell the truth. What they're saying is stop fucking tweeting about it and work it out internally. It makes you look like babies. But then this was today. Felicia decided, fuck it, going out swinging. So you can see, hmm, let's see, do I shut the fuck up, please, or do I continue exposing the truths of life to the chagrin of the 99% of people on earth who were villains? And so, on it goes, uh, you can see she started talking about again. I stand by everything I said back in 2018, I was being punished for my trauma, 
Uh, I'm not discouraging reporters at the Post from seeking help they need. Far from it. The Washington Post actions are doing that. Another big slash slash chain. On, I care deeply about my colleagues. I want this institution to provide support for all of us. That's a long-standing problem at the Post. Many other news organizations need it as well. Here's a fantastic episode of WNYC's on the media last year that explains why this issue matters the issue being uh the post is a place where many of us fear our trauma will be used against us based on what happened to me here's what bruce shapiro said blah blah look at this just look at this and then i don't know who the colleagues anonymously disparaging me in media reports are but i do know that the reporters who issued synchronized tweets this week downplaying the post workplace issues have a few things in common with each other they are all white they're among the highest paid employees in the newsroom, making double and even triple what some of the national desk reporters are making, particularly journalists of colour. They're among the stars who get away with murder on social media. Keep in mind, she's literally been tweeting for five days about this and had no punitive measures taken against her. Uh, of course, the Washington Post is a great workplace. It's a great workplace for them. The system is working for them. What about for everyone else? gaze into the abyss of terminal onlineness uh to those bizarrely attacking me for speaking it's being attacked again uh people are just like now how many ways are they are there to say shut the fuck up to those bizarrely attacking me or sp for speaking out or snidely saying things like day seven of course i'm still speaking out this is about systemic issues that run far deeper than a single tweet by any employee pushing for change takes far longer than seven days and are there many folks inside and outside the post who have voice support and joined in calling for institutional change thank you i'm sorry i haven't been able to reply to everyone yet because my dms and inbox have been flooded a good problem but you all rock like you haven't just been sat there f5 in and then just as i was about to turn on the fucking stream the inevitable happened the Washington Post has parted ways with national political reporter Felicia Sonmez, capping a week of fighting that stoked conversations over newsroom inequity and social media use and pitted reporters uh, against each other. So look, let me let me tell you, she's gonna she will have a she's gonna obviously appeal a lawsuit she's gonna say it was sexist all of the other ists whatever else i don't know again why it's these like very privileged white women that constantly want to like stump up for marginalized groups as if they you know can in any way kind of speak to their experience it's a very weird phenomenon especially in american newsrooms but anyway the reality here is like i don't understand what possible case she could think she has she has been allowed to fucking go on publicly violating their policies for six days she was privately warned gently warned you know then to told explicitly twice in a company-wide memo so she wasn't even singled out we will enforce our policies she has continually attacked people violating those said policies also airing dirty laundry and saying the washington post is a terrible employer to work for because they used her uh, trauma against her even though a judge tossed that out of a court when she filed for a suit she was allowed to continue working there four years with a sizable salary despite having leaked private information to a rival publication and she believes she is the victim in all of this not to mention the person that offended her by tweeting a joke is suspended for a month without pay it's insane and what you have to consider is this this is what it took to get fired from the washington post dave weigel he retweeted a sexist joke it was inappropriate for the position he's in he should absolutely uh you know it took a rebuke for that maybe a month uh without pay is appropriate maybe it's harsh that's up to you the reality is taylor lorenz as we saw has continually not only violated journalistic ethics lied has blamed the editors for getting caught in those lies has then also subsequently been shown to have lied in previously previous reporting prior to going to the post reporting she said she never did even though it's publicly there and there's no action being taken against taylor lorenz retweet an edgy fucking joke and that's you gone head for the hills and felicia is gonna say that she's been harshly done by by getting shit canned what what other option was there it's pretty clear to me she was trying to get fired so she could play the fucking violin and watch this space because what happens next is there is going to be a ton of uh, people 
uh, that are going to basically be like writing up little apology pieces. And uh. Felicia Somers was betrayed by the Washington Post again. What does it mean for America's newsrooms? Now, what's really interesting as well, just to put a little bow on all of this. I do feel a little bit of like, not sympathy for Dave Weigel. He, he made his bed and he's going to lie in it. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think he expected his own kind of like colleagues to like come at him, especially a colleague he'd previously supported and everything else. But it is always worth mentioning because, you know, got the receipts. Uh, David is someone who believes cancel culture does, just doesn't happen. That it's just something we talk about. It's just something that we make up for the sake of, you know, filling our tedious and empty lives. He says, do people still talk about cancel culture? Or is critical race theory taking up that space in the conversation? What are they teaching our children? It's definitely more compelling than Jerry Seinfeld can't even do a set at Oberlin anymore. So, at the end of the day, mate, you've now had a taste of it. Yeah, it's still very much a thing. And probably we should spend a bit more time talking about it. Because if you think what happened to you compared to what happened to your colleagues is proportionate and a sign of a functional newsroom, I reckon you might have a refreshed fucking perspective on this. So, the Washington Post is indeed a kindergarten. It's full of children. Much like the American media landscape itself. It's full of children and idiots and liars. And this is why the news, the media, it's not fit for purpose. It doesn't serve you. It doesn't help you. These people are vapid narcissists living the most privileged lives. And yet, all they do is navel gaze about how tough it is for them to exist in the Twitter sphere. How tough it is for them to, you know, not be abused for doing things, by the way, that are against the very fucking ethical boundaries that they are meant to swear to uphold. It's, it's insane. But that's just where we're at. And so that's going to, that story, by the way, we're, 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 we'll end up coming back to that a year from now, I guarantee Felicia Sonmez will be popping off in her lawsuit. Taylor Lorenz will have been quietly let go from the Washington Post. The Washington Post will say, we always love the reporting, but it's great to see her spread her wings and go to somewhere else. And she'll get picked up by, like, I don't know, MSNBC to talk about the murky fascist pipeline ahead of an election, maybe. Who knows? Guess we'll have to see how the fucking midterms pan out.